You're listening to a High Voltage Radio Network podcast. Find more at HighVoltageRadio.com. This podcast is a member of the Place to Be Nation family. Visit us at PlaceToBeNation.com, the only place to be in your pop culture world. Welcome to the Kings of Sports, the program that's changing the game one show at a time. With your hosts, Nate Milton. Yes! That boy's good. And Marcus Vandenberg. What's up? So sit back and relax, because you're now Down with the Kings. Down with the Kings for years, about ten of them. Recruiting suckers, Mac and Mike and making men of them. And welcome to the Kings of Sports, the program changing the game one show at a time. A.K.A. the world's most dangerous sports show, A.K.A. iTunes' longest-running weekly episodic program, produced and hosted by two or more African Americans who are not affiliated with a major network. I'm your host, the Godfather Nate Milton. We got a big show for you guys and girls this week. We're gonna talk some NBA. We're gonna talk some XFL. We might even get into the ponies uh, on this week's show. But uh, I can't do it alone, so let me bring in my tag team partner, the man that. That has the, the the perspective of not only a, a a longtime veteran journalist, but also a degenerate gambler. So I'm sure he can tell me what went down this past weekend at the Kentucky Derby. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Southern California, the regional director of the light skin delegation, Marcus Vandenberg. How you doing, brother? What's up, Nate? How you doing? I'm doing good, my friend. Ready to uh talk about all of the the action, the the stories that we got to talk about this week. But for the people. Watching on Patreon, they can certainly see we got three people in the shot this week. So it's not just Marcus. It's not just myself. But we got somebody that looks kind of familiar, but not really. Like, he kind of looks like <laughs> Professor Chris from L.A., but, but a little less dangerous, a little less gangster, if you will. This is the, the new, the, the, the new clean-shaven Chris from L.A. What's up, brother? <laughs> What's up? Yeah, that that beard I'm not is not coming back for at least another month. It was just the upkeep, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I was telling Marcus before we went on. I was like, "Yo, well, this is the first time we talked to clean shaven Chris, looking like a, a MSNBC political pundit up here." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. My girlfriend misses the beard, but yeah, it's just right now. I just can't deal with that. Yes, well, uh, Chris, of course, is coming to us from the podcast Wild Card Shakeup, so it's it's good to have you, brother. Uh, <laughs> good to be here. But Marcus, we we have a couple things we want to get into this week. I think in the A block, we'll just talk a little NBA real quick, since Chris is here, certainly somebody that follows the hardwood. But we're also going to talk about the Kentucky Derby from this past weekend and and some of the shenanigans that went down. So you want to start with the hoops or the horses? Ah, uh, the hoops. All right, so, uh, yeah, I guess uh, let's start out in the West Coast uh, because that's where you guys are. Uh, But last night we saw the Houston Rockets even up the series with the defending national champion Golden State Warriors, world champion, I guess you could say, even though they don't play nobody in Yugoslavia. Uh, What have you made of this series so far? We'll start with you, Chris, uh, uh, because I I think even though, you know, it's it's good that the Warriors are getting a bit of a test, Ultimately, it's not going to mean anything because I can't see the Rockets pulling this series out. Yeah, that's my thing, too. I just don't see it happening. I kind of even thought before going into last night's game that the um, Rockets would even up the series um, because the way the Warriors play, it's like they, they do take nights off, you know, and um, it seems like they can turn it on at any time. I, I think they I think it goes two more games. Mm. Um I think um you know that and that's that's uh yeah, that's just just me. I think, you know, if lucky, you know, that the the Rockets might be able to drag it out to seven, but I think ultimately in the end the the Warriors um are gonna um take this one. But the game last night was really good though. I I, I did enjoy that game. Mm. What, what about you, Marcus? Because I think we might have seen the best of the Rockets, but we've also seen kind of the worst of the Warriors, in particular Steph, these last two games. I like the Rockets in this series. 
Really? Um, yeah. I, I think uh, you got to remember the series went seven games last year, and really it, it came down to some pretty bad shooting in that game mm. seven, which was pretty unusual for the Rockets to miss, I think, 20 sit straight three-pointers in a row. Yeah. Um, so I think people got to remember that this was a, a tight series last year. Uh, this Warriors team is not as good as it was last year. They've been, they haven't been playing as great. I think the Rockets now have some confidence after two games at uh, at home. Uh, so it would not surprise me if the Rockets showed up in Game 5 and, and stole a game in Golden State. And then mm. if the Warriors are down 3-2, uh, we've seen that before for Golden State, but I, I'm, I'd be really curious to see how they respond uh, being in the hole like that. Mm, I, I like the way you're thinking, Marcus. I don't think it's going to happen, but I, I would hope. I hope that your prediction comes true just because I'm petty and mm-hmm. I want to I want to drink in the tears of, of sad Bay Area fans. Uh, but I'm still going to stick <laughs> with I'm still going to stick with uh, Golden State. Chris said in six. You're saying what? Rockets in seven. I'm doing Rockets in six. Rockets I feel like you. Okay. I I think if if they they have to win at home, I don't see them winning yeah, game seven yeah. in Golden State. So. I think the only way they do it is they, if they steal game five and then finish in Houston. Okay, so we got Chris going uh, Warriors in six, Marcus going Rockets in six. I'm going to go Warriors in seven. Uh, I, I still think, even though the Warriors aren't what they were last year, I think they're still the best team remaining in the playoffs. And if they go out, I don't see them going out here. Uh, so I'm going to go with the with the Warriors in seven. Uh, on the other side of the bracket, Marcus, you got Portland and Denver. Much like uh, the the other series tied up at two right now, uh, I don't remember what we picked from last week because last week seems like two weeks ago. Did uh, we make picks? But, I don't know if we did. I thought we did. We might. We I, might have. We may. It was. It was right after end game. So Chris knows, man. My whole mindset was was in a different place after watching that movie. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna go with. I'm going with Denver in this series. Who you got, Marcus? I'm going with Denver as well. I think they're they're the deeper team, the yeah. better team. Um, and I think Jokic has uh, turned out to be the best player in this series. And I think that will continue and, and sort of lead Denver to the conference finals. Yeah. Uh, what about you, Chris? I, I like Denver. I don't like them by a lot, but I, I do like them better, um, if that makes sense. I think... I think they're just because of the um, the depth. If nothing else, I have to go with Denver. Okay, and Marcus, I don't know what it is. Again, maybe I'm stereotyping here, but I can take Chris's NBA analysis a lot more seriously now with with, with the beard gone. <laughs> I thought you were gonna say with the Lakers gone. <laughs> they went yeah, too. Yeah, hey, hey, speak, real quick, speaking of the Lakers, man, what did, what did you make of your boy LeBron on the barbershop the other night, Chris? Talking I about uh, magic. Oh, I missed that episode of the barbershop, but um, I, 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 um, I heard about it. Um, look, I, I am going to root for LeBron and, until I'm given a reason not to root for LeBron. That's that whole situation was kind of uh, just, for lack of a better term, janky. Um, I don't think Magic handled it in the most professional way. You know, it's it's one of those things where, you know, maybe everything happened the way it should have happened, mm. and um, you know, I think LeBron, um, you know, look, th- th- this this. He's not in the Eastern Conference anymore, and, and this Lakers team—it's let's for for all intents and, pur- and purposes—it's a scrub team. It's not a good team. Uh, he he's he and he got injured for yeah. a good chunk of the season as well. So um, I'm 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 still gonna ride with Le- LeBron. This is you know different than you know my past uh, feelings on LeBron, <laughs> but you know it's. <laughs> This is this is not an ideal situation for him. I, and I mean, Marcus and I can relate to to LeBron and what he was saying in the barbershop because you know we we used to have somebody that we worked with that, that just <laughs> disappeared without saying anything <laughs> as well. So I mean, I, yeah. I feel you. I feel you, LeBron. Yeah. In that moment. Uh, when you think, yeah. I mean, 
pretty much the same thing. He, both both people were too afraid to just say to the world, <laughs> "I'm leaving the show, I'm leaving the team." Yeah, so, yeah. There's some parallels there. Mm, and, and both both like to wear nice fancy suits. So yep. Who knows? That's all I'm gonna say because I I want to put Chris in a situation. <laughs> I, I still talk to that person. Chris, like, I might have to see this dude in the street tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's, let's go to the East real quick. Uh, we got Philly and Toronto tied at two, and then Milwaukee with a, dare I say, insurmountable 3 1 lead over Kyrie and the uh, Celtics. Uh, Marcus, first of all, uh, Milwaukee beat Boston. Anyway, Boston comes back. And second of all, who you got in Philly and Toronto? Uh, for Milwaukee, Boston, one, two, three, Cancun. That series is over. Uh, <laughs> Raptors, Sixers has been an emotional roller coaster for someone who is invested in the Raptors for God knows reason. God knows why. Um, uh, that game four was very important for Toronto. Um, mm-hmm. I think game five tonight is very, very important for Toronto because. This team, I don't think, has uh, the moxie to go down 3-2 and, and win in Philly. So yeah. I, I think the winner of tonight's game will win the series. And uh, since Embiid has looked not great and sick in Toronto's home, I'm going to go with the Raptors. Yeah, that, to me, that's what it all comes down to in that series is, is Joel Embiid. If he is right, then I think the Sixers are by far, even though the uh, Raptors have the – Best player, I think the Sixers have the best team if Embiid is right. right. Mm-hmm. But if he's not right, then it becomes a crapshoot. And so I am much more willing to bet. And I think it'd be different, Marcus, if they had time for him to kind of rest. But in a seven game series, uh, in, in a playoff series, you don't have time to rest. You know what I mean? You have to get ready and you might have a day or two in between, but that's about it. You yeah. don't have time to get right. So I'm going to go with Toronto winning a very tough series. And then, like you said, on the other side of the ledger with uh, Milwaukee and Boston, I think Kyrie is not only thinking about Cancun. He's also thinking about the garden because, you know, the rumors. So, uh, yeah, I, I think this is uh, this this to me, Chris, sets up for a very interesting Eastern Conference Finals. With Toronto and Milwaukee, uh, it's like a. I mean, Toronto's been in the finals the last, uh, been in a position either the yeah. semis or the finals the last few years. No, but they've always they've had never, to LeBron. Never been to a conference final. Yeah, that, that, that's the thing. Le- LeBron has been their crypt tonight, and I'm yeah. I'm rooting for the Raptors this year. I'm actually rooting for them to win the whole thing. That's I don't just because you want to the- see uh your your man uh, Kawhi come to L.A. At this well, all over. Uh, yeah, I, w- I would like to see something like that happen. But, you know, just because the Raptors have been, like every year they've been a good team. It's not th- th- they if it wasn't for LeBron, they would have made it to the finals. You know, and that's like one of the things about about LeBron is, you know, as far as the Eastern Conference, you know, force. That's what he was. That conference belonged to him. So any other team that was trying to make any kind of headway in that conference, the minute you ran into LeBron, you were you were in trouble. This is the one year where they um, – this is their best year to make it, you know, deep into the – uh, playoffs and or, um, even to the finals, and I and I hope they do. So for that reason, I am rooting for. Um, and I do. I think they're a better team than Philly. I, I honestly uh, do. So for that reason, I, I'm rooting for the Raptors. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And so I, I, I think that out of all the teams left, Marcus, and this might seem. This might seem weird just in the, in the fact that it's probably the least star-studded team out of the four remaining teams in the East. But honestly, I think Milwaukee might be the team that gives Golden State the best potential matchup in a final series. Just from a defensive standpoint. Yeah. 
Um, I don't know. If they, I don't know if they have the offense. They, they probably don't. But yeah. just in terms of stopping what Golden State can do, I think Milwaukee might be the best equipped to do that. Mm-hmm. It would be an interesting series. I, th- I think the lack of experience would definitely hurt Milwaukee in yeah. that sense. But um, and I think Toronto. I think Toronto would be interesting too because I think I mean Kawhi in the series against the Sixers has been. Uh, not Kobe S. He's been Jordan S. In terms of just efficiency and dominating on both sides of the ball, he's averaging 38 points on 61 percent shooting from the field, which is ridiculous. Um, I think for the playoffs as a whole, he's shooting 59 percent from the field, I and mean, that that's like yeah, that's numbers from your your big man, not from your yeah. your uh, small forward. So, um, and I think Siakam could give Durant yeah. some some headaches there. Uh, defensively, so, but that's that's still such a long way from now. Yeah, but I mean, I I hear what you're saying though, because effectively, listeners, what Marcus is talking about is when Kawhi Leonard is on the court for the Toronto Raptors, he gives them maximum security. Hmm. Mm. And that Christopher Marquise Ely is what they call in the business the professional segue. Because we better right. talk about these horses real quick. Did either one of you guys watch the Kentucky Derby? Because I, I got, I, did not. I got tricked into watching the Kentucky Kentucky Derby. We need that tricked. Okay, because I have family members that that are interested, and I'm not gonna put nobody's name out there for tax purposes. But you know, some people in, in my family know that you know I am a broadcaster. I'm somebody that pays attention to these sports things, and so sometimes mm-hmm. I get called for advice. Uh, for, for, you know, just, just for uh, recreational purposes, I believe that's what they say, Marcus Vanderberg. Mm-hmm. So uh, what, what'd you, you, what'd your daddy do? So, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, sometimes if the national championship is on, I might get a call from somebody I ain't talked to since Christmas. Hey, what do you think about this particular game? I'm not saying what happens after that. I'm just saying I give my advice to the best of my ability. So. Mm-hmm. I was asked uh, about this, this particular race. And I don't know nothing about no horse races, so I just watched. I I know Woody Page talks about horse races a lot. So I went on Woody Page's Twitter to check what he said. And I just, you know, kind of formulated my own opinion based off of Woody Page. So I'm flipping through the channels on Sunday evening. And this is how I got tricked into watching it. Because I don't care about horse racing. I don't even care about the Kentucky Derby. Uh... To me, the Kentucky Derby, and, and let's see if you agree with this, Chris. To me, the Kentucky Derby is white people freak Nick. <laughs> it's rich yeah, white I, people freak Nick. <laughs> yeah, that, um, like, I, I, like, as a kid, I went to a few of the horse races at, at um, Hollywood Park in Inglewood, California. Shout I out never, to Hollywood Park. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I never had a good time at that stuff my no. uncle was always betting on horses uh, that's probably why him and my aunt got a divorce wow. but, um, that's Getting really just deep. <laughs> oh. that's, that's just i've never been into that stuff mm. man the, the furthest i've been into it is i, I like the movie sea biscuit mm. so because it stars spider-man yeah 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 oh, well, wow. it's a, it, it a decent movie yeah but so so marcus i like like i said i I get the appeal of the Kentucky Derby. It just doesn't appeal to me specifically. Have you been to a horse race, uh, Nate? I want to say it was a Santa Anita out there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've been there, too. When I used to live in San Diego, it was a long time ago. Like, somebody on the the Navy base was, like, was taking a group out to Santa Anita. And Mm -hmm. I happened to tag along. And, like like I said, it's, it's cool if that's what you're into, but I just wasn't into it. Like I can okay. see the appeal of being at the at the track. I just you know I got better things time. to do with my time. Uh, so I'm flipping through the channels, Marcus, and uh, I believe it was Mike Tirico, uh, famed Italian television broadcaster Mike Tirico. Not black Mike Tirico. Uh-huh. <laughs> Not black Mike Tirico, and he was talking about uh, one of the owners on the horses. And all the stuff they had to go through and the jockey. And, you know, Mike Tirico is one of the best storytellers in broadcasting. And, you know, he, he sucked me into the show, Marcus. He's like, and, and here's the story of the jockey, Guadalupe Valdez. That ain't even a man's name, but it was some type of Spanish. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying. He's like, 
Guadalupe Valdez came to this country. He couldn't speak a word of English, and all he knew was he wanted to ride horses. And it, it's taken him 35 years from when he was a small boy to get to this point. And I'm just sitting there like, you know what? I've, like in, in five minutes, you have told me a better story than WWE has this entire year. Because <laughs> now I'm invested in seeing if Guadalupe can win the race. <laughs> like the race, what's the, the race going to take about two, three minutes. I can leave it on TV for a minute. So I leave it on there. Right. See the race. Maximum security win the race. But then there's a challenge. I didn't even know you could challenge a horse race in Marcus. Yep. And it was, what they say, it's the fastest two minutes in, in sports. That's the tagline. Mm-hmm. This challenge took like 15, 20 minutes for them the to come down. 21 with, minutes, and, yeah, after that. Yeah, come down with an official ruling. And finally, it turned out that a country horse, a country house, was uh, like a 64 to 1 uh, yeah. long shot, ended up winning, even though he wasn't a horse that got impeded with. And I'm just like, this is amazing, like the drama. And, and the people at the – this might have been the most rowdy, the people at the uh, – at the uh, Kentucky Derby work because they were booing my man Country Horse when Country Horse was on and picked up the check. All that money they lost, I'd be booing too. He was a favorite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did, did you watch any of the race, Chris? I didn't watch any of it, man. I, um, I, I like I saw like the highlights and stuff on the news, but that is pretty much it. I wasn't um, like I just wasn't invested in that. The last time I was into one of those horse races, I wasn't really into it, but it was just my friends and stuff were, talk, were talking about it was uh, Pine Alley. I think that was in 05. Um, yeah, that's the last time. So, You know, the last time I watched the race before this, Marcus, and it ties in what we were just talking about, mm-hmm. was when, when our, our boy Kevin Krigger oh, was on the right. horse. <laughs> right, that was yeah. the derby, right? Yeah, Kevin Krigger was in the derby like five years ago, four years ago. That was the first year of the show. Yeah. Because we had Kevin Cricket come on, and uh, he told us he was going to win the Kentucky Derby. Yeah, it was. It came out the the best catchphrase of the show. Yes, <laughs> Cricket, yeah, please, Chris, uh, Cricket, please. <laughs> he didn't win the Derby. Oh, Kevin Cricket! Shout out to Kevin Cricket! I don't even know if he's still racing. <laughs> Where are they now, Kevin Cricket? Yeah, uh, he's he's now uh, racing for Wakanda. Oh, 20, 2017, he was mulling to come back. Oh. He walked guess, away in 2014 from racing. Oh, wow. So after our show, he was like, you know what? Wow. These niggas are so disrespectful. <laughs> I'm going back to Trinidad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so shout out to Kevin Kruger if, he's, if he ever comes back to the to the horse racing game. But, yeah, that was – it was crazy, Marcus, because I, I don't know, like, if, if you – obviously you didn't watch the race, but I'm sure you saw, like, the outcry from it, man. What did you make of the whole situation? Uh, side note, he did come back 2018. He, okay. He last year, so. Um, just like a whole video the from the from the Sacramento Bee. They did a whole feature, video feature on him getting back okay. to horse racing. So, look at that. Look at <laughs> our man Kevin Trigger. All right. Um <laughs> What was your question? Why does it look like Chris is a phone? Like he's actually running a race. Yeah, I don't know. Do you? Am I still on the picture with you guys? No, it's like I, a wall, it's like a wall, like stripes and. Yeah, but it looks like he's oh, running. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, I think I know what the. Okay. Yeah, I think I reversed the camera by accident. Oh, let me fix this. <laughs> Making me dizzy. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Oh. Um, but no, what, what, what did you think about it, Marcus? Because I, I thought it was it was fun to see kind of like, I don't want to say real sports, but like stuff that you see in the NFL or, or, you know, Major League Baseball, like with these challenges, see that implemented into the world of horse racing. Yeah, I mean, controversy is good for mm-hmm. ratings, and I think the ratings... Eric Bischoff, controversy creates cash. Yeah, the ratings reflected that. There was some buzz and people tuned over who might who might have not watched the race. The, da- the problem is uh, maximum security. It's not running the Preakness. Yeah. Country home. Is that it? Country yeah, house. Country, country house. Also out of the Preakness. So you have your two, your two baby face hills in this it's, race. It's, it's terrible booking by the, uh, by the horse racing community. 
Terrible. So they're both not in the race. Uh, I mean, the Preakness, who cares? Because you have your, there's no, there's no triple crown. And yeah. then there's no disputed triple crown because uh, Matt's some security side in it. So at this point, it's going to be a snooze. Hey, really what they should have done was they should have kept maximum security as the winner, slid country house some money under the table, been like, hey, we're going to tell everybody maximum security won, but we're going to break y'all off with a little bit of paper. Mm-hmm. Y'all wait. Uh, we're going to have him run into Preakness. And then what's the third leg? The uh, Belmont? Uh, Belmont's Bel- the last one, step. yes. Yeah. And then like we'll, we'll have uh, maximum security win the Belmont, and then – Country House comes back, and uh, we're going to have Max Security win the Preakness, and then Country House comes out for the Belmont and wins that one. That's how you, that's how you book that story, Marcus. Hmm. That's, why they, that's why Vince McMahon needs to take over horse races, too, like he, he's about to take over football. <laughs> oh, yeah. We'll talk about that in a second, like literally yes. a second. The people watching on the Patreon feed, like it's going to be maybe 20 seconds, 30 seconds. Uh, that we stopped talking. But then uh, the people listen to the classic audio. Uh, we're going to take a break, be back on the other side, because we're talking some WWE, we're talking some XFL, and we're talking somebody whose pockets might be deeper than Vince McMahon's, Marcus Vandenberg. Oh, yes. The He's return, back. The return of crumbs. <laughs> the return of crumbs. So don't go anywhere, stick and stay. We got more Kings of Sport right after this. Welcome back to the world's most dangerous sports show. Follow the danger online at facebook.com backslash the kings of sport. Can you dig it? Can you dig it? Can you dig it? back on the kings of sport ready to close up the shop for yet another week but before we do we got to give you what you want we got to give you what you need and what you want and need is ratchetness in its full effect we got to give you that full dose straight no chaser and that's what this segment is all about it is our repository of ratchetness our cornucopia of crazy where we take the wildest stories from the world of sports pop culture entertainment politics pro wrestling and we give it to you and that's what this is all about. And so, it, it is, uh, I think we got a good place to start this week because this is something that ties into sports and wrestling. And of course, it is the rebirth, Marcus, of the XFL. I don't know why Chris is not wearing 
his San Francisco Demon shirt today. <laughs> Did you not get the memo, brother? Who was our team? Was it the LA? The LA Extreme? Tommy? It's Bre- Extreme or Express? Yeah, yeah. Extreme. Something like that, yeah. Tommy yeah, Maddox. LA Extreme, Tommy Maddox. Tommy, Ma- Tommy Maddox, yeah. 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 <laughs> mm-hmm. But yeah, the XFL is back for 2020, and uh, Marcus Vandenberg. I know you might not take this league seriously, but there are some people with some pretty big names or at least some pretty big initials that take this thing seriously, namely Fox and ESPN and your people, Marcus Vandenberg, your people, the mouse. Was, yes. Well, first off, put some respect on the, the one-time champion, L.A. Extreme. All right. <laughs> we're we're defending <laughs> the title this year. Um, <laughs> they just hired a coach today for the L.A. team, uh, Winston mm. Moss. The okay. uh, former Packers coordinator who was in the yeah. Rodgers mess. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Disney, which is ABC, ESPN, and Fox, have uh, are teaming up to carry the XFL in 2020. And uh, this is already sounding like a better TV deal than the first round, which mm-hmm. was, I believe, uh, NBC. The, uh, M- NBC, NBC and, and uh, UPN. UPN. Sp- Spike and, TV Austin. Yeah, that's right. So yeah. I think uh, having ESPN and Fox brings a little bit of uh, legitimacy to mm-hmm. this league. Um, I think it's interesting that this league will – I think the f- finals is – after the NFL draft, I want to say. Um, they are also running a show, or running a, or carrying a game, excuse me, on Fox Sports 1, the night of WrestleMania, which will be interesting to see how that plays mm. out. Um, but they are covered for the entire season and the title game with at least, I think, two games a week on yeah. high profile networks that people can find. Yeah, and I think we all expected the Fox component. Because of the mm-hmm. SmackDown deal, like, I mean, they can say it was for the wrestling, you know, the, the price they paid for SmackDown, but you ain't paying that much damn money for, for SmackDown. I think yeah. we assumed there was some kind of maybe handshake agreement that we'll, we'll at least take a look at the XFL as yeah. your broadcast partner. But the ESPN one is the one that surprised me, Marcus. Because yeah. ESPN, not that Fox doesn't give them credibility, but Fox to me seemed more like a business deal. ESPN, on the other hand, like ESPN didn't have to do this. Like that gives them credibility from the standpoint of a company, maybe not so much the actual on the field product, but at least from like a, a fan standpoint, if you're on ESPN, like, okay, maybe, maybe I should pay more attention to you now. Mm-hmm. So, uh, oh, I think it's, the, it's a, yeah, go, oh, ahead. go ahead. I was going to say the title game is April 26th. It's the day after the NFL draft okay. next year, which is in Las Vegas, mm-hmm. which leads the question, um, would it be wise to just have your title game in Las Vegas, considering you're going to have all these NFL fans mm-hmm. already in town for three days? Um, is that your best shot is to just sort of go all in on that weekend? Yeah, they should totally take the the tack that, you know, the inverse of WrestleMania week, where during WrestleMania week you got the big entity of the WWE and these other entities kind of feeding off of the overrun of people in town. And here you got the NFL draft, which is this big entity. If you're the WWE, if you're the XFL, You'd be smart, in my opinion, Marcus, and that's a great idea to kind of play the role of an AEW or an ROH or an Impact and feed off of the crowd that's going to be in town for that NFL. Mm-hmm. So, what, what, what did you make of this, Chris, when you when you heard the news? I know you are somebody who has been waiting for years uh, for the return of the XFL. I know you still got your He Hate Me jersey in the closet. <laughs> what, what did you make of this news, man? I, I didn't make anything of it. Um, here's the thing. 
when they got the deal back in when was it 2000 or whatever they were on nbc um nbc was the number one network on television at that time they they had a lot of viewership that's when they used to have the must-see tv lineups and all that crap um so i never thought that them that visibility was an issue Mm. um they were also on UPN, but the you know XFL isn't the NFL. Like when Fox uh, acquired the NFL, it was an instant game changer because Fox was a fringe network, and the NFL turned Fox into um, a, one of the major networks. Um, the, you know, I, I really I don't know what the goal is for the XFL. They they haven't said how they're going to be different on the that, that stupid. Mm press conference on the alpha youtube network which is um the still the only video they have up on that channel uh vince mcmahon said you know he was asked about the anthem and this and that and he said yeah we're gonna make players stand for the anthem or whatever it's like then what are you doing differently the nfl for, for for all its faults the nfl is still quality television you know the games are compelling it's an institution that's why people watch the nfl like is is the x xfl going into the first redux season knowing that they are never going to compete with the nfl are they eventually wanting to compete with the nfl um like i i just don't know the end game for this i i don't see them lasting long I don't know who's going to want to sponsor this on ESPN. There's a lot of bullshit that comes on ESPN <laughs> during the weekend. You know, it's like, like they show like bowling and, you know, <laughs> stupid stuff on the weekend sometimes, especially when football season isn't in. They'll show like people playing dominoes and shit. Like, so I don't, I'm not, I don't know what what's good about this i really i, I it, it's like good you got your tv deals and stuff but at the end of the day you need eyes to the product are you gonna have that is mm. is my question you know well, first of all i want to apologize to all the bowlers that listen to the show i know uh, so rude i don't know chris is being real disrespectful to pete weber jr <laughs> and them boys out there y'all y'all are real athletes but uh marcus i think chris brings up a good point inside of, of, of the shade, uh, which is I think it's great that they've acquired this deal because going into it, I thought the one advantage that the AF had over the XFL, besides not having the, the tarnish of the original XFL attached to it, was that they had a TV deal with CBS. But this deal blows that deal out of the water. So I think from, a, from an accessibility standpoint, it's great. The question remains, though, is there still an appetite for for off season football, which I don't know if there is. Yeah, I mean, if you go back to the original XFL run, that first game did fourteen million people, fourteen mm-hmm. million viewers on NBC. Uh, that's not going to happen with the, the relaunch in twenty twenty. But I don't think we'll see a drastic drop off like we saw the first time in two thousand one, where the ratings just absolutely tanked. Um, right. I do think there's something to have. There's something to say about having games on ABC on a on a Saturday afternoon, or um, towards the end of the season they have games actually on Thursday night on Fox, mm-hmm. which I think is interesting because you figure Thursday will be your XFL night, and then Friday will be your SmackDown night on Fox. Yeah. Um, so I think that I think that is um, important for the league. And uh, listen, it it. it the TV deals are great, but it comes down to who's in the lead and what's the quality of football. And I think we saw with the AAF, the quality of football was not great, and who in the lead was not enough to bring in the casual viewer. Um, if if the XFL's goal is to become a feeder lead for the NFL, I think that is their best case scenario. Um, and if they, think, if they if they presented themselves as that, I think people would understand that as opposed to trying to mm-hmm. 
compete with the NFL. Um, so I think deep down, I would hope Vincent Man knows by now that they're not doing, <laughs> not going to compete with the NFL. So yes, instead of trying to Vincent compete Man with the NFL, Vincent Man has shown himself to be so flexible over the years, Marcus. I, I know, yeah. I know. Um, like what? What? So what I learned at USC Annenberg um, about you know, trying to creep in on the market is there's got to be some kind of stump, you know, the, the, the top league or whatever has to be doing something wrong or something that you think you could do better to uh, improve on some, like something that they're faulty with. Um, the, the NFL's problem isn't super long games. That's the WWE's problem is super <laughs> long television. That's um, I don't know, like, like, um, take Blockbuster and Netflix, you know, Blockbuster was doing big, big numbers before Netflix existed, but Netflix, they had this idea that, hey, if we deliver movies to people, don't show them late fees and this and that, we can actually, you know, steal the market share from Blockbuster. Like, mm-hmm. I don't understand what... The ex, what the XFL like like Marcus said the best case scenario for them is to be kind of like an ROH or a feeder league for the um, NFL because if they're thinking that they're going to be on par with the NFL that that's just not realistic with the with the NFL the way the NFL is structured it's going to be much easier for an AEW to to you know, creep in on WWE's product than, you know, anything else. Yeah, and I think the original XFL, to to give it some credit, like it did force the NFL to make some changes in terms of production. Yes. Right. But those, are, I, those are good changes. Yeah. But I don't know if in 2020 you'll have the XFL doing something so far outside the box that it would make the NFL say, hmm, from a broadcasting standpoint, we need to do this. I don't know if there's that much left to do within the body of a football game that isn't already being done. Oh, Broadcast, no, but there was, I think, the the point after stuff's pretty interesting. Mm, yeah. Um, That's yeah. Point. But, but, like, the NFL's problems were, they, it was like, it wasn't like the NFL had problems that, the, that they stole from the XFL. It was just like, oh, these crane shots are cool. Why don't we add this? It wasn't like if they didn't add this stuff that the NFL would would like free fall. You know, it's like I, okay. I'm, I'm gonna tell you something though, Marcus. From a broadcasting standpoint, it's actually not a bad deal for ESPN, and because uh, according to reports, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but they're all they're doing is picking up production costs. Yes. And they get to keep all the advertising money. Yes. And so to me, and I hate to say it for the wrestling fans listening, but facts are facts. Even as high profile as the SmackDown on Fox will be when they do the launch in October, you're still going to get better advertisers for an XFL than you will for wrestling. Totally. Just because wrestling still has a stigma. So even if the XFL quality of play isn't great, I bet you for that first season, they can get some Budweiser or, or get, you know, Coke or, you know, a, a quality sponsor for Fox or for ESPN to put some money in their pocket. So that's why I think if this isn't going to be an aft situation where they fold midseason. They're going to get at least one year, maybe two, just because of the deal that's, that's in place. But it's ultimately going to come down to, is this a product people want to watch? Yeah. And listen, if you can easily gamble on this stuff. People might be more invested to watch. Yeah, and I'm I'm gonna I'm rooting for them to succeed just because I hope it takes Vince McMahon away from <laughs> WWE television more. You know. Mm, now that's that's a good segue there, Chris. I see you learning. You learning these tricks. Uh, <laughs> Vince McMahon was all over. He was like Vince McMahon was like Puff Daddy at the Source Awards in ninety. Was it ninety four, ninety five? 95. 95, you know what I'm saying? Vince McMahon was all in the video, all yeah. on the track, uh, <laughs> and and he was all over that first 30 minutes of Raw on Monday night as a response to the uh, ratings drop. And so I don't want to spend too much time on this because I've got two hours 
this week to talk about uh, this with waiting on a uh, review of SmackDown. But just real quick, guys, in, in terms of the ratings and, and in terms of Vince McMahon and, and kind of the uh, the wild card stuff, the superstar shakeup, do you see any of this having an immediate effect on the ratings, particularly as we get deeper to the NBA playoffs and that comp- competition gets stiffer in terms of other competing shows? Chris, you can go first. Um, I think that, um, I mean, I, I think the ratings are going to get worse before they get better unless they, there's got to be a culture change in WWE because they have, um, turned themselves into a company that, um, that you just don't trust anymore. You, they, they don't, um, I was listening to, um, the Wrestling Observer the other day with uh, Mike Sempervivi and Brian Alvarez and some fan did a list of like WWE advertising things Mm -hmm. and the amount of times that they actually followed through so there was like 200 and um, like 97 episodes of Raw that they, they looked at um, where they advertise something and only 95 times in that year did they, they follow through on, on what they advertise you know that's a problem hey, you know, hey, hey. Car- card subject to change baby it's on your ticket yeah that, but that's not what card subject to change means card subject to change <laughs> me- subject to change means is if some if the fighters or somebody falls ill or some <laughs> emergency happens that you can, you know, a suitable substitute would be put in place. Not you can just blatantly fucking lie and say, <laughs> hey, we're going to do this and then not and then do something else. And then right. also, I think that Saudi Arabian d- deal hurt them as well. You know, I mean, this is this. We live in a time now where people are sensitive to these issues. Um, there are a lot of people who said they were going to boycott WWE after that Saudi Arabia stuff happened. And a lot of people followed through. Um, so it's like they've, they've got to figure something out as far as like, you know, their public relations mm. stance, what, what's, what's important to them. How, how are they going to get viewers back? Because um, it's, it's easy to ride high when you're the only game in town, but, um, you, you know, eventually all this stuff, the chickens will come home to roof. I'm not saying it's going to happen anytime soon, but you know, this, this, the, the, the TV, the last couple of weeks is just abhorrently bad, man. Mm-hmm. It's, it was so abysmal, so abominable. Um, and I just don't know like how you can sustain doing this continuously what about you marcus i think the problem it's a couple of things one obviously storylines are a bit of a mess uh the direction of the show is a mess yeah uh, there there's not a single talent that is out there that they can just bring in to sort of right you know pop a rating um outside of a cm punk which you know not gonna happen yeah I'm gonna say like mm-hmm. punk, maybe rock, like yeah. Uh, but I mean, rock, maybe, back, rock comes back for what a night, and then what? Like, He's not maybe, back maybe seen full time. But like, yeah, yeah. Cena's not popping rating. Stick around. No. Yeah. Tri- Triple H said on one of those investor calls a few years ago, he said that the new model of WWE is to make sure that the company stays bigger than individual talent, not. You know, the superstars, they don't want superstars to become so big to where if they leave, they'll be left high and dry. The problem with that is that's the only way eyes are going to come to the product. You need mm-hmm. somebody whose brand becomes equal to or bigger than the brand of WWE. That's how every sports entity works. You know what I'm saying? LeBron James is a is a is his brand is as big as the nba's that's you know that that's just a that's how this symbi- symbiosis works you can't have talent 
every talent on the roster be a dweeb because <laughs> the the it's not that's not going to bring eyes to the product. You need that Rock. You need that Austin. You need even a Bret Hart. You need somebody that you know when people think of that company they or think of that person they think of that company mm. um this is just this is just branding 101 it's 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 not even rocket science you can't have um you know the company everybody cuz that and that's a, a part of the evolution too eventually people become bigger than their surroundings and they have to move on there's nothing wrong with that. The Rock couldn't be in WWE in 2019 because he became who he is. And you now we're seeing it with Cena and we saw it with, you know, Austin. And that's just that's just the circle of life. So so what you're saying is the company needs a David Ruffin. We can't have a company full of Otis's because ain't nobody coming to see you, Otis. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. So, so right now the WWE is just full of Otis Williams, and we're looking for Eddie Kendricks or a David Ruffin, or at least a Dennis lead. Edwards. Yes. Yeah. Somebody got to sing lead. Somebody has uh, to which, sing lead. Which kind of brings it, kind of ties into the other WWE story for the week, Marcus. We can we can touch on that too right now, which is the uh, Leo Rush deal, All and right. how that kind of speaks to maybe the culture behind the scenes at the company. Uh, I don't know how much you, you've heard about the story, but, uh, you know, apparently Leo, they, it was reported Leo Rush had heat in the locker room. Leo Rush came out and spoke to Fightful last week and gave his side of the story. And whether it's Leo Rush or whether it's, you know, the revival in their contract situation, it feels like there's a maybe a shift going on right now between the way things were handled in the past and how things are handled now in 2019. I have some thoughts. Not so much about Leo Rush, but just mm. the contract stuff in general. Okay. Uh, Nate, if you had a contract at Zaspies and you mm-hmm. were you signed this contract to work two years, and six months in, you decide, hey, I'm not happy with this job. I'm not happy with this contract. I'm going to go on social media and put Zaspies on blast for my bad contract. <laughs> How do you think that would play over at work, Nate? Oh, it ain't going to go over too well, Marcus. No, it's not. And I think we're seeing this with wrestlers who I think there are ways to professionally um, air your grievances to your management behind the scenes and in private. And I think we've seen maybe some of that with certain talent being released, uh, like a gold dust. And then there's ways to embarrass your company. And if you embarrass your company, uh, the company is not going to be motivated to sort of help you out. And I think we've seen that now with Sasha Banks, with Luke mm-hmm. Harper, with Leo Rush. Um, I just feel like you're running the risk of heat. Not heat. I don't want to use that term. You're running the risk of backlash internally yeah. if you decide to embarrass your company. Um, so I, I, I understand where Leo's coming from. But at the same time, situation like that, maybe you don't need to air your dirty laundry. Um because you're still under contract with this company. And do you, you still think have to show up something to work? And this is something that Chris and I were talking about offline. But do you think something in the company has changed, or do you think it's the mindset of the modern athlete, the modern wrestler, that has changed, or both? I know. I think they see a shiny new toy in AEW, and they, there's a there's a, a a probably a legitimate second option where there was not a second mm-hmm. option mm-hmm. prior to prior mm-hmm. to now, um, and I think. Wrestlers are getting antsy, and, and they want to see what this other option is all about. But at the same time, they have this contract that all of a sudden they don't want to honor. And, uh, yeah, if I'm WWE, I'm going to say, no, you, you're going to honor your contract. That That's the whole point of a contract. Focus. This is what they need to do. The, those, those contracts are bogus. Um, if you're in the legal field, um, and I'm surprised, like, when I see these lawyers, they always jump on WWE for, like, wellness policy violations and stuff. That's always going to be a problem because they never complain about those those contracts when they're in the middle of it. They always wait until they're broken down, bombed out, and depleted to start complaining about the stuff that was happening to them in WWE. They're not true independent contractors. We know this. 
um, because the, it's it's not even the 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 the, the legal lease of it makes no sense. So you either lawyer up and challenge it that way from a legal standpoint. It's going to cost you um, a good chunk of money. Say, hey, this contract, when I signed it, I was bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, <laughs> and wasn't thinking about the long game. I was thinking about the short game, but this is a faulty contract. Here's the thing. Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, don't put up with the shit that wrestlers put up with. They just don't. There, there was a class action lawsuit let recently about the um, Uber um, uh, independent contractor status, and they pay, they had to pay out like millions of dollars to to Lyft drivers or Uber drivers or whatever. I don't understand why re- why wrestlers one why you sign these contracts in the first place, two you. When, when you're in the middle of this contract, you don't legitimately try. I do agree with Marcus in the sense that why publicly state your grievances? This is what the legal system is for. Mm. You get on, um, you, you make, you, you get, you hire a lawyer, you tell them what you're trying to do. And anytime there's ambiguity to the law, it's up to the courts to establish a precedent. And there hasn't been a precedent established with this independent contractor status. That's just a fact. Mm. Do you think it's a matter of people not wanting to rock the boat until now, like Marcus is saying, because now there is a a legitimate, viable alternative to some extent with AEW, whereas two, three, four, five years ago, there wasn't any place else to go. Okay, yeah, yeah, it's... And they've got archaic practices in WWE that still haven't really died down. So I want to read a couple of these quotes from some of the wrestlers on Leo Rush, if you don't mind. One of them, uh, this is Jericho responding to a fan on Twitter. He says, the key statement there is, if I was a big star, you're not, so you don't know the respect and dedication you uh, need to make it to the WWE. I never once made in quotation marks, a young guy carry my bags, but I've shown respect every day. To disrespect the vets in any way is taboo in our biz. So that's Chris Jericho talking about Leo Rush. Booker T, I've never got heat throughout my whole wrestling career, the whole 20 plus years as a performer. I never got heat. I never kissed up to anyone, but I never got heat. I worked with, with the best of them. I worked with Austin, blah, blah, blah. And he goes on to say, you know, you know, sometimes you got to do what you got to do. You got to play, play the game. And then Mark Henry, it's not a race issue. It's an ego issue. Who are you? Nobody is exempt from being respectful to the business and guys. We all have done it. Austin did it. Rock did it in re- reference to carrying bags and stuff. Here's my thing with all these veteran statements. Not one time. Do they say Leo Rush did anything that was breaking the rules <laughs> or, like, out of pocket? All this shit is about is carrying bags and crap like that. Like, really? To, to, to be fair, this is, a, this is not a wrestling thing. This is a sports thing. This is... I mean, well, okay, but also, to be fair, I've been on sports teams. When you have a guy that doesn't want to do the hazing and stuff like that, well, at least in my history, you don't fuck with that guy. You, that's as simple as that. You don't, you're, you don't, you don't, have, no one's saying you got to be friends with this guy, but if the guy isn't into your little rituals, you leave him alone. You know what I'm saying? Like with Kobe Bryant, Kobe Bryant wasn't into all that rookie hazing crap, and he wasn't the player that he ultimately became his rookie year. And nobody was like, you know, they left him to his devices. They were like, okay, you don't want to be a part of our brotherhood. Don't be a part of the brotherhood. But what is that? Like, should you be getting fired? But here's the thing. Leo Rush is not Kobe Bryant. Leo, but Kobe Bryant wasn't Kobe Bryant that first year of him being in the NBA. He was airballing. 18-year-old Kobe Bryant was uh, not Leo Rush. I I think, listen. 
to me, that's a, that's that's a new point. That's that's got I, I nothing think that's, to do with that's an important point, like, though. He, he, what no, leverage? No, it, 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 what it, it, leverage it, it, does Leo Rush have as a talent to to? Mm. I mean, well, let's that, put Leo Rush is. I mean, Leo Rush is not a star. I'm sorry. I mean, that's what, you, but that's what it. See, that's that's what it comes down to is. No, no argument of substance. It's like, okay, we do not think this guy is a star, so carry our bags, motherfucker. Well, is anybody in this company a star, though, outside yeah, of the saying, bubble of who, 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 Who's in this? Like, they're, they're just, they just offer the revival $550,000 a year contracts. Lee. And Leo Rush is complaining. Does Leo Rush not have any validity to say, Leo, hey? Leo had an offer. Not, Perhaps too. Yeah. So they offered know. Leo. A, I would. I would consider Leo that contract very generous. I'm sorry, considering it's where he, gen- where he where he's at currently, getting it's a five a year deal. Offer, but does he not have the right to think that it's? See, this is the the problem I, that I have with, with wrestlers is is they don't have any autonomy. They don't have any agency when they they get these contracts and they just accept them. I, I respect Leo Rush for at least saying, hey, you know, I think this is a bogus offer. Um, I don't want to participate in your little wrestler's courts bull crap. I'm not grabbing waters for anybody. Even though, you know, you, I, if I were him, I'd pick the hills. I would die on yeah. better. But, you know, I don't think that that's – I don't think that stuff is a, is a fireable offense. I, I, if he was like – you know, doing like some Me Too crap back, or if he was just, you know, like snitch, like snitching on guys for, you know, not for stuff that has nothing to do with him. If he was D'Angelo be, Russell, yeah, I, I'd be like, okay, yeah, this guy, <laughs> this guy's problematic. But if he's a, if he's if he doesn't want to involve himself in that hierarchical system, I don't, I don't see like the the problem with it and like i said the complaints that these guys are levying against this guy have nothing to do with him showing up late for work or being disrespectful or as far as like um like not following company protocol he doesn't want to follow the backstage protocol and if that's going to be a thing then wwe should put that in the rules. They should say, hey, this is when you sign with WWE, you do this rookie bullshit. That Here's the thing. Know. No one no one told him to sign with WWE. He he had to know people over there to know what it was like before he signed with the company. So part of this yeah. is on him for even signing for, with the company in the first place. Um what? And again, it it goes back to embarrassing your company. No, I mean, listen, I'm not saying he the man should be silent, but I do think that if you go public with some of the stuff, like if you go public with some of the stuff and you have a real job. He didn't go public with it in his defense. The the, the story story leaked out by Fightful and his name was getting bashed all over Twitter and he responded in kind to it. He didn't, it wasn't a situation with like Harper where he goes and tweets out I asked for a release or not even a situation with Sasha Banks. This guy's name was drugged through the mud for a good week or so before he finally responded to that Fightful um, article and was like, look, this is what I feel and this is what, you know, how I feel like I've been treated. And my my, my thing on it is I think you can have two things happening simultaneously, Marcus. Two things can both be true in this situation. Could Leo Rush have handled this situation both from – a backstage component and from a social media component, could he handle those situations better? I think so. But I also think if he feels he has valid concerns with the company and they are not listening to those concerns and he's not the only one that is not listening to these concerns, you know, he's not the only one who has had grievances over the past few months, um, I think the company might need to look inward and say, is there something we're not doing that is – you know, to the best service of our talent. Because, mm-hmm. you know, you, you don't want to rearrange the system for one guy, but if you got 10, 15, 20 people 
that have brought things up over the past six, seven months, you might say, okay, what, what are we doing that is not in the best interest of our people? Why, why are they, why is the, the morale not where it needs to be? And, you know, what steps can we take within reason to say, okay, you have a feeling about this, you have a feeling about this. Well, this is what we're going to do to address that. But on the back end, this is what you have to do, whether it's, you know, the locker room stuff or the appearances out in the public. This is what you have to do. So I, I think there seems to be, just from an outsider's perspective and from talking to people that have worked there, it, it seems to be a lack of communication from the top end to your talent. And I, I that's think, not going to be good, good in any situation. Yeah, I, I think it's two separate issues. But I, I do think, listen, I would never work for a company. I've, I've heard too many stories about <laughs> WWE that I would never work there. And a lot of this stuff isn't new. So when a guy yeah. signs with the company, they have to know going in, that there's a there's a chance that well, this might go sideways. Well, here, here's in in the de, de, defense of the talent, so to speak. You can take advantage of somebody's youthful naivete with these contracts, especially when you're coming from. I wouldn't like, even go that far. I, I don't like. I don't even think you can go. You need to go as far as youthful naivete. I think you need to go as far as. They are the company that gives you the biggest, biggest exposure yeah, with the exactly. biggest money up front. You get the biggest and exposure, for, but there's limitations. There's yeah, less for a lot of guys. Yeah, there's nowhere and, else and for you guys these, girls to go. And a lot of these people aren't learned enough to, you know, like, to, to understand. They're not looking at the long game. They're looking at the short game. Yeah. Which is, which is, um, a, which is problematic in and of itself. Um, but I really do believe that WWE is just not the company that it was even, you know, 10 years ago or maybe even five years ago. There, the, the, AEW isn't even a proven commodity yet. <laughs> and people want to go there. You know what I'm saying? Like this, like, this is just ridiculous. It's like the AEW has done nothing. And people are wanting to leave the comfort <laughs> of the WWE contracts to go to this place. Hey, like come, this, come to Death Row Records. Come to Death Row Records. Yeah. You're tired of your manager being all in the video. Come to Death yeah. Row Records. Like how many people, how many NFL players have you heard with <laughs> AAF or XFL coming through being like, yeah, I want to get let out of my contract to go to these places. <laughs> it just, it's, it's this, and this is a WWE problem. It's like, Everybody should want to be in WWE. Everybody should want to have lengthy WWE careers because it is the NFL of this industry. So that that should be an automatic, and it's not anymore. And that that's an, that's another issue in and of itself. So we're going to put a pin in this right here, Marcus, because Chris gave me another perfect segue because he's talking about people planning for the short game. But you and I have spoken many times on this program about one man who is playing for the short game, the long game, and the end game, and that's your boy Crumbs, a.k.a. Byron Allen, a.k.a. Oh, yeah. The Mogul. The Mogul. Mr. Mr. Coming up next. Coming up next. Well, it's Mr. Coming up now. Um, coming up next. <laughs> Byron Allen, back in the news, because he was involved in the Sinclair deal mm. of the regional sports networks that were um, acquired by Sinclair last week. $9.6 billion that they purchased from Disney. Um, they will have uh, 21 channels. In total, so think of your, you know, five sports blank in your local markets, and part of that uh, investment group was Byron Allen, and uh, this is from Bloomberg. He said, "quote It's a huge opportunity." Uh, the networks were put on. Uh, excuse me, uh, Allen said in an interview, "The networks were put on the block by Disney after it agreed to buy a bigger piece of their former owner, Rupert Murdoch's 21 Century Fox Inc." Quote, I'm a huge fan of Rupert Murdoch, Alan said, and this is some of his best work. <laughs> uh, let's see. It does not say how much he 
spent as part of this deal or how much uh, controlling or, or control he has of these uh, networks. But our boy, Byron Allen, is now getting into the sports team. And uh, my only pause in this is it's Sinclair. And Sinclair yeah. is a right-wing uh, television – they're more than a network now – um, conglomerate, and uh, I don't know how I feel about Crumbs partnering up with Sinclair on a business deal. Maybe, maybe he's going to change the system from the inside, yeah, Marcus. Because he is politically liberal. I know that about um, Byron Allen. I've, I've met him a couple times here at LA, in L.A. Um, at these Democratic functions. And yeah, he's politically liberal, so I don't, you know, hmm. this is... I, I mean, was surprised. Business is business, was, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it is true. That's true, man. Oh man, why didn't Byron Allen just throw his hat in the ring? No, to be a political candidate, Marcus. We have enough. Byron, can you imagine Byron on the debate stage with Trump? Coming up next, lower taxes. <laughs> Coming up next, universal health care. Coming up yeah. next, we're retracting our forces from Iran. <laughs> <laughs> you can't beat that platform. <laughs> uh, that, that could be his catch. That, that, you know, have a, like those Obama Warhol looking shirts with that phrase on it. Coming up next. <laughs> yeah, um, that would work. It's, it's going to be interesting, Marcus, because I think, again, we don't know how much power he has within, you know, the system. Mm -hmm. uh, but we talked on the show before, like the moves he's made have been, for the most part, low risk, high reward moves. Mm -hmm. Like Byron hasn't really put himself out there to to take a hit when he hadn't had to. So I think this is a situation where he had to know, like, you know, you just talked about the WWE wrestlers before they signed a contract. You have to know what you what you're getting into. I think he has to know what the politics of Sinclair are. And I don't think he will allow himself to be a party to that. Uh, the question is how you know how far can he distance himself when he's now in bed with them in a business standpoint. Speaking of, um, there's another story from yesterday. Byron Allen back in the news. Uh -oh. uh, Byron Allen's Entertainment Studios has struck a deal to buy four small market TV stations from Bayou City Broadcasting. For one hundred and sixty-five million dollars, man. Huh. Uh, Entertainment Studios announced the Bayou City deal on the heels of Friday's news that Allen has joined with Sinclair Broadcast Group in the ten point six billion dollar acquisition of twenty-one regional sports networks that Disney was required to sell in order to acquire other twenty-first century Fox assets. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm seeing it on Friday. Yeah. So he, his networks will be in Evansville, Indiana. Um, the CBS affiliate and Fox affiliate, and then Lafayette, Louisiana. Mm. He has an NBC affiliate and a Fox affiliate. So he's just spending all kinds of money. This is random, random ass. Like man. Byron, I bet you Byron Allen was a dude when you played Monopoly. Oh, and, you man. Know, a, a lot of people wait strategically for what they're going to buy. Byron's mm -hmm. just like, yeah, I'll take Marvin Gardens. I'll take yep. Baltic Avenue. Hotel, like, please. Yeah, shit that Ooh. don't even add up. Byron is like, yeah, he's got all these bits and pieces of monopolies on his on his side of the board <laughs> yes so he's uh listen we we joked about crumbs but <laughs> uh for the sort of portfolio he's building he's pretty yeah. um he's not talked about enough from the from the black community yeah. in terms of what he's doing and, and, and we gotta talk about who he beat out for those stations too it was um an investment group that uh, Magic Johnson and um, Ice Cube was a part of. And, you know, Ice Cube had been talking about, before the, the Disney purchase, Ice Cube had been talking about getting those networks, those regional Fox networks, for a while. And I'm kind of disappointed that he didn't get them. But, you know, it's, it's still a good thing that, you know, well, it, it could be a good thing. I don't want to say it's a good thing. No, Byron S no. Sinclair wasn't getting in the bed with Ice Cube. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. Uh -uh. 
<laughs> well, see, well, uh, well, Sinclair had that same issue too when they tried to buy WGN and then WGN reneged because of that commercial that they put out with the um, news stations and all the anchor local anchors saying the exact same right wing pre message or whatever. I don't know if you guys ever saw that. Yeah. And I, I couldn't see them working with Ice Cube for, for a sports network. No, not so much. Break, break yourself, fool. We got Pac-10 basketball coming up next. Okay. Yeah. Hey, man, bit, bit three is almost, almost here. Yo. Season, season three. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's the reason why they didn't deal with Ice Cube, because he would have made them play all the big three games. Bit three is not on Fox yeah. anymore, by the way. Kiss your like, nobody wants your... to watch 40-year-old Jason Williams play. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's I watch it every now and then, but it's not great. No, no. It could be better, but I think the three-on-three, three, I would almost rather see five-on-five five just to have it mm. feel like an actual, base, uh, actual basketball game as opposed to this half-court stuff. And then just go ahead and bring back Slam Ball. Mm-hmm. You know that, Marcus? Yep. Oh, yeah. The trampoline, just bring back Slam Ball so these dudes can, can jam yeah, again. Pat, so they, so they can Pat. die trying to jump on the trampoline? Come on. <laughs> 50 yeah. injuries in the first week of the season. Like, yeah. damn. Yeah. Sl- uh, Slam Ball exists, too. It does. Slam Ball still exists? Mm-hmm. Just not on television anymore. Like, like Roller uh, Derby, know, just a random uh, link? I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if Pat Croce owns it still, but, um, yeah, it's it's still around. Uh, and, and we need, Marcus, next time, we, we, do, we do need to uh, listen to that uh, podcast with Byron Allen that uh, Black Man USA keeps trying to get us oh, to listen yes. to. So next time we talk about Byron Allen, we'll, we'll, we'll have a listen to that so we can okay. add some more perspective. Because I'm actually interested, Marcus, because, you know, now I'm, I'm kind of more, I'm, be, I'm becoming more financially literate. Uh, and, and I want to hear what Byron Allen has to talk about because I'm sure he's got some, he's got some interesting stories and, and some good advice probably. Because <laughs> you're right, like, people don't think about him, but if you look at who owns... Mm-hmm. Media and who owns entertainment in terms of once you get past, you know, kind of the big three or four companies, he's probably up there in terms of yeah. somebody that owns a lot of real estate in in the entertainment world that we never talk about. Yeah. Right. Or maybe, I mean, maybe he wants it that way. Maybe he wants to fly under the radar and, and <laughs> pop up to random NABJ meetings unannounced. And, yeah, you know. that's probably the first thing he mm-hmm. says on the, on, the, uh, on the podcast. Like, Byron, how'd you do it? You got to stay under these white people's noses. Yes. Yeah. Don't let them see what you're doing because then they're going to ruin it. <laughs> yeah. And he's, he's, he still has like the um, syndicated uh, shows that he does too. And then um, the, the like he has these game shows that come on like at these odd hours of the night. Hold on. Hold um, on. Wait, 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 wait. This is new information. You telling me mm-hmm. Byron Allen's got a game show? Yeah, well, he he's not. So he's got this one game show. I can't think of the name of it, but it's like um, it's like Hollywood Squares esque. I was gonna say, was it Hollywood no. Cubes? <laughs> oh no, celebrities. <laughs> and he, it'll, it'll celebrities. Like, let's uh, let's put that in quote, please. Celebrities. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 he's got like in the um, center square, Jimmy J J Walker. <laughs> now he'll have like not a list. But it'll have like Wanda Sykes on there, and then he had um, what's the the woman's name that used to host uh, the View that was on wrestling with MVP? Um, oh, uh, Sherry Shepard. Yeah, she's <laughs> oh, he's like got a, like black celebrities. Uh, I, <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to talk about Sherry Shepard. I've learned my lesson. Yeah. Oh, okay. He's got <laughs> black celebrities on there. And then uh, one of those, like, yeah, so he's good. This week, like, Wanda Sykes, Sherry Shepard, and the kid from Everybody the, Hates Chris. Right, yeah. Are you talking yeah, about Funny You Should Ask? Funny You Should Ask, that's what it's called. Oh, yeah. wow. Is yeah. Byron the host? He's not the host. There's some other toolbox dude that's the host of it. So here's, he's here's like a, a list of people that have, who appeared on season one. Uh, Howie Mandel, Anthony Ooh. Anderson, Tiffany Haddish. Okay. Yeah, John he, Lovitz. They are C listers. Uh, John Lovitz is C. Uh, <laughs> Cheryl C. Hines. John Lovitz is F. Uh, Louis Anderson, Cedric the Entertainer, okay. Billy Gardell, Tommy Davison, Sherry Shepard, Tim Meadows, Tom Arnold, Cheryl Underwood. Tim Meadows from yeah, Saturday Bill, Night Live, Tim Meadows. Yeah, Bill Bellamy, Jimmy Walker, 
I hope it's at Jimmy wow, Walker. Wow, I didn't even know. I was just joking about JJ. Jack A. <laughs> Jack A's on oh, here. Jack A. Uh, Gary Owen, of course. He's problematic now. Oh, Gary uh, Owen. <laughs> David Allen Greer. George Wallace. Loney Love. Paulie Shore. Vivica A. Fox. I feel like Gary Owen is kind of taking the place, Marcus Vandenberg. Like, you remember 10 years ago when Michael Rappaport was kind of on the fence? Yeah, now he's off the Before he went all the way over to the dark side? Yeah. That's where I feel like Gary Owen is. Like, Gary Owen, he's... He's not Rappaport bad yet, but it's like sometimes he'll say something. I'm like, oh, Gary. Mm-hmm. Here, here's the key number from this press release. This is from 2018. Um, funny, you should ask. They're going to produce 520 episodes through four seasons. <laughs> <laughs> you, said, you said 500 episodes in season one? No, no, uh, this got renewed. So okay. through the four seasons that they're they're shooting to do, they will have by the time they're done through four seasons, they were five hundred and twenty episodes. Damn, and he probably shot all five hundred twenty in about two weeks. Yeah, half hour show, five hundred twenty episodes. That's how Byron Allen gets that shooter. money. It's Kobe Bryant. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's Kobe Bryant. <laughs> like, like, well, like I was reading some article on him in Variety a couple years ago, and like he has a system. What he does is he produces these shows for super, super cheap, and gets these advertisers that need exposure to their products to advertise for them, and they pay top dollar to this guy for advertising on his stuff at these odd hours of the night or whatever. So, I mean, he's no, crumbs, like, crumbs he's, yeah, Yo, that, yeah. Yeah, that, that is how crumbs are. Even if you look at entertainers, all he did at entertainers was he took his camera crew to a press junket and got like yeah. some side room. Yeah. And made, press it, yeah. made it TV, made it content. Yeah. Made it content. Yeah, it's like not, not one of those episodes that, entertainers or entertainment studios.com or any of that crap who has a one compelling interview on no, of course not. or like oh the river that interview someone did is like byron allen is like a far far cry from larry king and, and, far- and the thing about byron is like he gets people to have movies out but it's never like a good movie like it's like this yeah. week it won't be anybody from avengers endgame but it'll be like your boy uh your boy from uh, that Intruder movie, uh, Dennis uh, Quaid. Dennis Quaid. Dennis Quaid. Like he'd be like, from the hottest movie in the country, Intruder. Dennis Quaid. Like <laughs> <laughs> that movie made a thousand dollars this weekend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so shout out, shout out to Crumbs, man. Crumbs <laughs> is a is an American hero, Marcus oh, Vandenberg. Man. Like, we, like I, I'm not. I'm not here for any more jokes about Byron Allen because this. Oh man, yes, I am. I am. Dad, speak for yourself. <laughs> this man been putting in work, Marcus. He he. Byron Allen crawls so that we might run. <laughs> right, yeah. he, might, he might be coming at you with, with a with, with a hefty contract here soon, Marcus. I already told Marcus if, if Crumbs gives us a call, we're selling out. Like, oh yeah. <laughs> we're we gonna be like Leo Russ. We're not even gonna look at the contract. We're just gonna sign it. <laughs> yeah, just, just sign it. They complain later. Yeah, and then six months later, Marcus complaining on the on the internet because Crumbs wouldn't let his wife in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so that's that's gonna do it for this week's show. Uh, I, I like how Byron Allen just just brings joy to to the world. Which is again, Byron Allen, twenty twenty. Oh, who would yeah. be who would be his running mate? Hmm. Um, Probably John Lovitz or John, someone like one of those white yeah, dudes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking I'm thinking Byron Allen probably wants he, he's smart enough to know that uh, he needs a woman on the ticket this time around mm-hmm. so I'm going to say Byron Allen and Rosie O'Donnell <laughs> uh, oh or um Cheryl Underwood she's she's oh, a man. Republican this, yeah like you could, they could probably uh, get you know some of the some of the Dems some of the Republicans and then she would get Cheryl the Lonely Love uh, Lonnie Love vote because they all look alike right yeah <laughs> <laughs> now Cheryl Underwood's the one that looks like Wesley Snipes and Tu Wong Fu oh all right that's, oh my uh, <laughs> wrap, wrap the show up me. before we get in trouble. That's mean, but I look go look look up Cheryl Underwood and look up Wesley Snipes, Noxzema Jackson, and then tell me I'm wrong next week. That's your homework, audience. 
So, <laughs> before we get in too much trouble, that's going to do it for this week's edition of the Kings of Sport. Chris knows I'm right. Uh, <laughs> I don't know anything, man. I'm Professor, sure. where can the people find you on social media? Uh, what you got coming up? And uh, let them know about NWA, which will happen at some point in the future. We have no idea because of schedules, yeah. but it's, it's going to happen eventually. Yeah, so uh, look me up on Twitter, uh, uh K M E Z does it. I'll probably add my name to Twitter soon, so that'll help. Uh, Christopher Ely, K R I S T O F F E R E A L Y. Um, Google me; you'll probably find some punk ass students giving me low scores on rate my professor. <laughs> wow. I don't know. Just, uh, <laughs> or they might be giving me high scores. I don't. I never checked that shit. But anyway. That's about it. Uh, what about you, Brother Marcus? Uh, you can find me on social media at Marco Will, M A R C O W I L L. You can find me on social media at in the number eight M O Z A I K at Nate Mosaic. Follow the show, Cospod, K O S underscore P O D. Check us out on Facebook, Facebook.com backslash the Kings of Sport. Uh, Patreon, Patreon.com backslash the Kings of Sport. Uh, I, I sense a theme recurring here. Um, iTunes, Stitcher, Podcast Addict, Spotify, uh, Stitcher Radio, Google Play. Uh, there's, there's probably more. Uh, Tune in radio, you perhaps. Can listen to the show. Yeah, YouTube. You can check out the show on YouTube now. Uh, when they don't flag us for music. Well, yeah, which is every show. I've only yeah I've, we've gotten flagged for every show. There's only been one show that I that that's been taken down because of the music, and I I can't even remember. I think it was it was like a random song too. Like I get flagged all the time just because I put real yeah. music in the show. But the one that got taken down, I think it was like I put in a Prince. country song. Oh oh. Like it wasn't even Prince. Like I put Prince in, and they they let Prince slide because Prince Prince ain't so, around. Them. Mm. Yeah, so the the trick to that is you got to use old WCW stock music because none of that stuff is copyrighted. <laughs> like, like, hey like man, Jericho's can we get Norman Smiley's uh, like Jim Rome? Yeah. Is he Norman Smiley's music? <laughs> can we get yeah, the, uh, yeah. Shane Helms Vertebraker theme song? <laughs> the fake Simmons, <Simmons-Yah. laughs> yeah. No, but um, we did we did our our man uh, Prince Ikea. Prince Ikea, still, yeah, one of the greatest things in WCW history, the, yes. the Purple Rain knockoff. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, that's going to do it for this week's edition of the Kings of Sport. Thanks for listening. Thanks for checking out the show. We'll be back next week with a new edition talking about the NBA playoffs. I'm sure we'll have uh, more ratchetness and foolishness uh, to discuss. Uh, but, uh, yeah, be back here next week for an all-new edition of of the world's most dangerous sports show, the Kings of Sport Podcast. So, for Marcus Vandenberg, for the Professor KME over here looking like uh, Jonathan Capehart stunt double. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's an MSNBC deep cut for, for those of you out there that watch MSNBC. Uh, and for Byron Crumbs Allen, the, the mogul. Uh, if you're listening... You know, have your people call our people. Uh, <laughs> I'll, actually, call Marcus. I'll let you deal with with Byron Allen since you're more prof- you're the more pro- uh, professional of us two. Okay. <laughs> I, I might say something that, that mess up the deal. Uh, he'll, he'll be like, you know, Cheryl Underwood happens to be my my child's godmother. Like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> I messed up the whole deal, Marcus. Uh, but yeah, for Marcus, for Chris. For Byron Allen, I am the Godfather Nate Milton. Thank you for listening. And coming up next, it's the end credits because it's the end of the show. And you've been down with the Kings. Well, that's all for this week's edition of the Kings of Sport. Be sure to come back next week for an all-new episode. You can leave feedback for the show on Twitter at KOS underscore POD or via Gmail at thekingsofsport at gmail.com. Don't forget to like and rate us on iTunes and tell a friend. The Kings of Sport is a production of the Mosaic Podcast Network. Whether you like it or not, he's bad. D-A-double-D-Y, thanks, thanks.
the pack like a Let me tell you something, mean gene. I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna leave it all on the mat. Cause that's what I do when I get it done so I can do it. Yeah!